The Glorious Orpheum celebrates 100 years this March, but it was not the first Orpheum in Kenosha. The original Orpheum was located on 56th Street near the Fisher Hotel, east of 6th Avenue. It opened on Saturday, September 24th, 1910. In addition to singers and other acts, the theater touted clear, bright, and beautiful pictures for just five cents. The Orpheum Theater is now equipped to give the public the finest service as a moving picture house. The Kenosha Evening News read on November 15, 1911, The very best pictures are the only ones used in this theater. But that original Orpheum lacked the glitz and glamour that would soon come. Local historian Lou Regani describes a building which sat on the northwest corner of 5th Avenue and 56th Street as, quote, pretty much a barn. By June 1917, the original Orpheum had closed its doors. And if I really want to confuse you, I can go on about the new Orpheum, which opened in 1912 at State and Main Racine, but let's just pass on that one. Edward and Fred Dayton were brothers both in name and in every venture they entered. They are now known as key instruments in the growth of Kenosha in the early 20th century. When Edward returned from serving as a captain in World War I, he had grand ideas of what could happen in Kenosha. He believed Kenosha needed a hotel. Kenosha had plenty of smaller hotels at the time, but Dayton thought Kenosha needed a top-notch hotel to rival those best hotels in nearby Milwaukee and Chicago. One that could attract the conventions and the big events which are passing at Kenosha due to lack of such a venue. Without much support politically from the Kenosha government, the Dayton brothers let their hotel idea simmer on the back burner. A year before the Orpheum's first bricks were laid, the foundation was already in place. The Dayton brothers, along with John and Thomas Sachs, were the principal stockholders in the Kenosha Orpheum Theater Company. They began working with Majestic Theater, located at 5717 6th Avenue, and Strand, 5611 22nd Avenue. The Orpheum Theater Company, with the help of Harry M. Vale and A.B. McCall, opened the Orpheum Theater we know today in 1922. But more on that soon. And later on, with the help of 189 stockholders, the 8th floor Dayton Hotel opened on June 20th, 1925, just south of the Orpheum Building. Edward Dayton remained influential in the community, becoming involved in other local theaters, including the Majestic, Butterfly, and Burke, as well as serving on the Salvation Army Advisory Board, the American Legion Club, the Knights of Columbus, and numerous more before his death in July 1956 at the age of 80. The Orpheum Theater was constructed at a cost of $400,000 which is $1.65 million today. And they first opened its doors were the lively barn of Chet Waddles and the wholesome liquor sales office of L.H. Beale once stood. Although numerous smaller movie houses were in Kenosha, the Orpheum was Kenosha's first real movie palace. The day prior to the grand opening, the Kenosha Evening News provided over four entire pages to coverage about the new movie palace. Headlines for the various stories include Orpheum Theater Beautiful Opens Tomorrow, A Structural Masterpiece, Orpheum Organ Second to None, and Meet Manager William Mick. The theater had a dramatic contrast of its plain commercial exterior. The lush, extravagant interior was designed in the French Renaissance style, and decorative details included rich rugs, gold pendants, mirrored lights, silk beaded upholstery, velvet drapes, silk wallpaper in red, blue, orange, and gold tones, and a $20,000 Barton organ that would run us $331,000 today. We had to work like beavers, but the theater will be ready in all of its glory for opening night, theater manager William Mick told the Kenosha Evening News prior to the grand opening. In the dedication address, Professor O.L. Tannery said, A struggling, ugly village has grown into a wonderful little city because of some splendid fellows dreamed dreams and made those dreams come true. When the theater opened in 1922, it reflected itself as an important cultural and moral force. This theater will never display a sign that announces, This picture is not for children, or for men only stated one representative of the Sachs Amusement Company, the operators of the theater. 
The opening night's main feature was the U.S. debut of Smiling Through, a 96-minute drama starring Norma Talmadge and Harrison Ford. No, not the Harrison Ford you're thinking of. There was another one. But it wasn't just a film the audiences were in for. The evening's program for the first week included an overture by the Orpheum Orchestra Supreme, Orpheum Flashes, which were newsreels from all parts of the world, Zeta Weber and Rosalie Reuter in Dance Supreme, Harold Lloyd starring in the 19-minute comedic short Never Weaken, George Lipschultz and Harry Linder presenting Musical Moments, and then the main event, Smiling Through. What a night. The upcoming weekend saw five big acts of vaudeville hosted by Yip Yip Yap Hankers from the State Lake Theater in Chicago. With concerns over the Spanish flu spreading across the world less than four years prior, Manager Max stressed that the theater took all precautions to keep guests safe and healthy. The audience in the theater will not breathe the same air twice, as a constant change of air will take place. Pure outside air being poured in every minute, while the foul air is being exhausted by large fans, he said. In 1922, the theater sat 1,422 people, and was billed the safest theater in the world. In addition to screen attractions, the Orpheum hosted vaudeville acts every weekend. So Mondays through Thursdays, the theater would show First National and Paramount films continuously from noon to 11 p.m. And on Fridays through Sundays, the vaudeville acts would take the stage for evening performances and Sunday matinees. Admission at the time was 25 cents for the films and 40 cents for the weekend shows which is four eighteen and six dollars and sixty nine cents respectively by nineteen twenty four the building as a whole was going strong. The Kenosha Evening News called it a veritable city in itself. In addition to the theater, other tenants in the building included a drugstore, a men's clothing store, an optical shop, a light lunch emporium, physician and dentist offices a beauty parlor, insurance and advertising agencies, voice culture instructors, piano and violin teachers, a tailor shop, a soda fountain, long-distance telephone booths, and more. The Orpheum was operated by Sax Amusement and managed locally by Edward Dayton until February 1928, when Fox Theaters, Inc. took over. Fox changed the name to The Lake and stayed that way for the next five years. In August 1933, Sachs regained control of the theater, and the Orpheum name returned. With the name returned to its former glory, the Orpheum hosted a gala on October 1st, 1933. One part fashion show, one part Hollywood premiere. Over two dozen celebrity impersonators arrived to the theater in glittering automobiles, surrounded by powerful searchlights, and themselves bathed in light dressed in lavish gowns and the best suits. Young Kenoshans portrayed such greats as Joan Crawford, the Marx Brothers, Betty Davis, Marlene Dietrich, Laurel and Hardy, and many more. Much of the glorious jewelry and fancy clothes worn by the stars were the hottest fashions provided by local shops like Siegel's, C.S. Hubbard's, and Corf's 6th Avenue. After the stars went into the theater, Ticket-goers were welcomed in for the U.S. premiere of the Victor McLegan film Laughing at Life, as well as entertainment from the dancers of the Elaine Beth Studio and music by the Orpheum Theater Orchestra. In September 1941, the management of the theater changed hands once again when the Orpheum was one of nine Wisconsin theaters involved in a deal where Saxon Music Company leased the theater to Fox Wisconsin Amusement. Though, from here on, the Orpheum name remains unchanged. In July of 1942, the Orpheum hosted an interesting event. At midnight on a Monday, guests were treated to a midnight voodoo party. Invisible demons will raise tables, raise spooks, and raise cane on the stage when H.L. Weber, a noted demonstrator of occult lore, brings his troop of invisible zombies for this shruddery thrill show, the Kenosha News reported at the time. 
In January of 1948, the new film Blaze of Noon, starring William Holden and Anne Baxter, opened at the Orpheum and a special guest was in attendance. The actual Academy Award, won by Baxter in 1947 for her role in The Razor's Edge, was on display in the theater lobby. A lifetime before American Idol took over the TV airwaves, the Orpheum hosted a talent competition in March 1949. 25-year-old George Kromchik won the $100 prize, advanced to the state finals in the talent quest for stars of tomorrow. However, Kromchik would not make his way to Hollywood. In the state finals, ventriloquist Robert King of Fond du Lac won the Wisconsin championship. As television was growing in popularity across Kenosha and the nation, movie theaters had to find new gimmicks to fill the seats. In a November 1956 ad, the Orpheum gave away a free small turner with copper tone handle. That's a spatula to us today. To all those ladies who purchase an adult ticket. Filmmaker Bert Ira Gordon returned to his hometown of Kenosha in June of 1958 to host a double feature of two of his films, his latest, Attack of the Puppet People, and War of the Colossal Beast, at the Orpheum. In a Q&A with audience members at the screening, Gordon gave his views on the film industry at the time, saying that horror pictures are just coming into their own. They'll replace westerns in most theaters. Telvin pretty much has the western market covered, Gordon said. Throughout the evening, Gordon also determined that filmgoers want more gore, less creepiness, no future-centric horror films, and fewer women, which drew some negative reactions from both men and women alike in the crowd. Beginning in 1958 and into the 1970s, the First National Bank of Kenosha hosted an annual Junior Banker Party at the Orpheum. All youngsters with their Junior Banker badge come out on a November Saturday morning for a full-length feature film, cartoons, and even free popcorn. In the summer of 1960, the words air-conditioned were first used in Orpheum advertising. That year, movie prices were 95 cents for a matinee, and evening performances were a $1.25, which comes out to $8.95 and $11.77 today. In October 1960, the Orpheum hosted a Safety Slogan Award Ceremony in conjunction with the Certified Grocery Stores of Kenosha. The first 2,500 boys and girls who submitted their entry received a free ticket to the show. Kenosha Mayor Eugene Hammond, along with Police Chief Stanley Hockendahl, participated in the event. The winners were David Arndt, who won a bicycle from Montgomery Wards, Bobby Allen Damaris won a wristwatch from DeGems Jewelers. And in third place, Blake Seitz took home a $25 gift certificate from J.C. Penney's. All attendees then enjoyed a special screening of For the Love of Mike, starring Richard Basehart. In 1961, Orpheum manager Wallace Wally Conrad took out a classified ad in the Kenosha News seeking a candy counter girl. But messy, ugly boys need not apply, requirements for the job being a, quote, neat and attractive girl. In June of 1962, the Orpheum Theater was leased by Prudential Theater Company, operator of 58 movie houses in the eastern United States. The Orpheum was one of 19 Wisconsin theaters in the deal. Bradford High School's prom of the late 50s and through the 60s make today's proms look pretty tame by comparison. The biggest social event of the year for many high school students was held on a Friday evening in April, and just hearing the plan for the evening is exhausting in itself. The downtown Kiwanis Club worked with the Eagles Club and the Orpheum for a full evening and morning of entertainment. After the completion of the first part of the prom, all the students were led by a police escort to the Orpheum where they enjoyed a premiere showing of a new movie. While the film played, Kiwanis Club members transformed the Eagles Club into a colorful arrangement for the second phase of the prom, the Afterglow. 
After the film, the students returned to the Eagles to be treated to a buffet and more dancing at the wee hours of the morning. As dawn began to break over Lake Michigan, a breakfast was served to the students after a long night of fun. This was created by the Kiwanis group after some parents voiced concerns of kids not going directly home after prom, but seeking additional fun, sometimes venturing to Milwaukee or Chicago. This tradition would continue to involve the Orpheum until 1970. The following year, prom goers would attend a screen at the nearby Lake Theater. The vaudeville and other non-cinematic forms of entertainment didn't come around as often as they used to at the Orpheum in the 1960s but they still had their share of interesting performers. On December 30th, 1963, a few top-notch TV and recording stars appeared in a one-night-only show. Johnny Tillotson, nightclub television and recording headliner, appeared with Paul and Paula, a young singing duo. The program also included appearances by Ronnie Cochran and the Cassilis Orchestra for two showings at 7.30 and 9.55 p.m. Win a puppy? That's right. In September 1965, the Orpheum hosted a promotion with the screening of the new film My Pal Wolf, the story of a little girl and her dog. Everyone in attendance received a free dog whistle, and kids were encouraged to enter the coloring contest, where two puppies were given away to the winners at a Saturday and Sunday matinee showings. By 1965, Traffic was a big concern in downtown Kenosha, and not from the shoppers. Some business owners expressed concerns over teenagers scooping the loop, driving back and forth down 6th Avenue, aimlessly driving and seeing friends, while not spending much money at the local businesses. To combat this, the city drew up a plan to change 6th Avenue from 55th to 59th to one-way, southbound only. One person who was adamantly against this was Orpheum manager Wally Conrad. Conrad got support of 55 of the 63 business owners along 6th Avenue who would be affected by this plan to stand with him in opposition. Rerouting prospective customers away from routes they've been using through force of habit for many, many years will discourage them and send them to our number one competitors, the shopping centers, Conrad said in the petition. If they put in one-way traffic, they're not going to solve the scooping problem. Two lanes moving in one direction will encourage drag racing. We don't care to discourage teenagers from coming downtown. They're the customers of tomorrow. In February 1967, the Academy Award-winning musical The Sound of Music began an eight-week run at the Orpheum, one of the longest-running films at the theater. By popular demand, the film would return to the Orpheum later in the year for an encore engagement. The month of October 1967 saw an increase in crime at the theater. The night of October 2nd, a thief broke into the theater and stole a coin box from a cigarette machine after apparently failing to break open the safe. 20-year-old William Young was later found guilty of the crime, as well as seven additional burglaries in the area. Just a few days later, a group of rowdy young people attacked 18-year-old Orpheum employee Jerry Golnick inside the theater, after Golnick ordered a non-paying patron to leave. A candy concession attendant was also struck by the group when she tried to intercede. Golnick had no serious injuries. He was treated and released at St. Catherine's Hospital, and Wally Conrad says he now plans to hire an off-duty policeman to protect the premises. After 11 years of managing the Orpheum and over 25 years in the cinema business, Wally Conrad announces his retirement in March 1968. Conrad was as much a fan of films as he was devoted to his job. It was said there are no questions about the business that he couldn't answer. Conrad would personally select the films that would be shown in the theater, and he took his work very seriously. Things would never really be the same for the Orpheum after Conrad's retirement. In the summer of 1968, the Orpheum changed ownership hands once again. United Artists Circuit, Inc., purchased a chain of 22 Prudential Theaters in six Wisconsin cities, including the Orpheum. Around this time, the Orpheum began to direct their focus to kids' matinees on the weekends and more adult-themed material in the evenings, although this was not exclusively the case. Many religious leaders of the community came together to lease the Orpheum 
for the week of October 18th to the 24th, 1968, for a showing of the 1965 film The Restless Ones, produced by Reverend Billy Graham. The film deals with problems of the youth and their relationship with their parents, society, and their God. The screen of the film was heavily endorsed by the community, including Police Chief Robert Bosman and Captain Balula Hartwig of the Juvenile Division, the latter stating, I sincerely wish that every teenager in Kenosha would see this film. Many local businesses encouraged their customers to see the film as well, including Kendall Shoes, 6208 22nd Avenue, and the Town & Country Shopping Center, both of which mentioned the film in their own newspaper advertisements. In September 1969, the theater, now in its 47th year, was beginning to show signs of aging. Firefighters were called when a large sheet of metal from an ornamental molding atop the building began to blow loose during a recent downpour. Additionally, a falling piece of masonry left a dent in a parked car and firemen had to nail the loose pieces back into place. In January 1970, after a showing of John and Mary starring Dustin Hoffman and Mia Farrow, two men entered the theater around midnight and held a gun to 21-year-old employee James Warrenberg. The thieves managed to escape with $515. They were never caught. Two years after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., audiences nationwide come out on March 24, 1970 for a screening of King, a filmed record, Montgomery to Memphis. The Orpheum was one of a thousand theaters nationwide showing the film, with 100% of proceeds raised going to the Martin Luther King Foundation. In June 1970, the first X-rated film was shown at the Orpheum, titled Vixen. But the Orpheum wasn't the only local theater getting in the adult movie game. That same weekend, the Roosevelt Theater were showing the X-rated Best House in London. However, this X-rated theme wasn't a permanent direction for the Orpheum, yet. The following week, the theater brought in the family film, A Boy Named Charlie Brown. On December 7th, 1970, boxing fans would come to the Orpheum, and for a $7.50 ticket, they could watch the Muhammad Ali Oscar Baravina boxing match, live from Madison Square Garden on the big screen through a closed-circuit telecast. A $7.50 ticket in 1970 is $53 today. In time for Christmas 1971, the United Artists Theater Circuit, owners of the Orpheum, opened UA Cinema 1 and 2 at the Wells Plaza Shopping Center on 75th Street and 57th Avenue. The two theaters with a shared lobby and concession stand seated 500 and 350 each. Although the Orpheum was playing plenty of X-rated features, it was still doing some family-friendly promotions in 1972. For a showing of the horror film Frogs, kids can get in free if they bring in their pet frog. In a cage, of course. Cash prizes were awarded to the most beautiful frog, and the kids were encouraged to dress up their frogs, suggesting mini bikinis or tuxedos. In June 1972, after the showing of Swinging Stewardesses and How to Succeed with Sex, two cans of movie film were taken from the sidewalk in front of the Orpheum while employee Leo Schussler was locking up. On March 10, 1974, another criminal incident was reported. This time, management called police to report the ticket booth was entered on Sunday afternoon and a cash box with $245 was taken. The theater was currently showing the horror film The Exorcist. The Academy Award-winning film had an excellent run at the Orpheum. The theater played the Linda Blair film for over two months. Later in 1974, the Orpheum began to cater almost exclusively to the adult crowd, regularly showing X-ray affair and nearly abandoning its daytime family functions. I speculate this is why UA theaters began to separate themselves with the Orpheum in the fall of 1974. See, since UA took over ownership, the advertising usually proclaimed the theater as a United Artists Theater, in quotes. 
Now, the advertising referred to it simply as the Orpheum, with no mention of UA theaters. It's also possible that United Artists were stepping back from the Orpheum simply because they didn't plan to operate it much longer. They were directing their focus to the new UA Cinema 1 and 2 on Kenosha's west side. In January 1975, Gonnering Realtors had posted that the building was for sale. Advertising for sales returned in June 1975, again with Gonnerings pushing for the sale of the building. This one read, With the new downtown mall coming, think of the possibilities for the Orpheum Theater and building. It is for sale, so call us for future information. A buyer did come forward. Bernard Bargain Bernie Chulu was well known in the area for his expertise in selling furniture and his memorable TV commercials. After starting in sales at Bar Furniture, Chulu became the owner of a number of furniture stores in the area, including Furniture Seconds and Mr. Furniture. Chulu also dabbled in real estate. September 30th, 1975 was a dark day for the Orpheum, both literally and figuratively. It is the day Bernie Chulu officially purchased the building from United Artists Theaters. Without much fanfare, the Orpheum film projectors shut down on that same day after 53 years, with the final showing being an X-rated double feature of Emmanuel and Candy. Chulu did not want to see the theater closed. In a recent interview with his daughter, Rebecca Chulu, she believes that the city was not working with her father to help keep it open. My dad tried, and he really took pride in the Orpheum, Rebecca told me in a recent interview. Chulu cannot be held completely responsible for the downfall of the Orpheum. There are many other factors that work here as well. In the 1970s, downtown Kenosha had become a shell of what it once was. Many businesses were simply abandoning their downtown locations to move to brand new accommodations in strip malls on Kenosha's west side. So much that Kenosha converted 6th Avenue to the Southport Mall in the fall of 1975. Numerous local politicians and investors saw the Orpheum as well beyond its prime and not worth the time or the money. And film distributors were not eager to work with an independent owner like Chulu and multiplexes like they knew UA Cinema in Kenosha and the Mark and Rapids Plaza Theaters in Racine were starting to put single-screen movie houses out of business all around the country. In January 1976, the theater itself became home to the Kenosha Indoor Flea Market on the weekends. Throughout the mid-1970s and approaching the 80s, the storefronts and offices in the building seemed to be doing okay. They were home to such businesses as the Express Restaurant, the Finance System of Kenosha, Kenosha Christian Fellowship, Water World, Automotive Parts Company, Wisconsin Ambets, Transcendental Meditation, Spectrum Music Studio, and the Big Brothers and Big Sisters organization. In late 1981, developers Tom Pitts of Pitts Brothers and Associates and Wayne Haney of Wilson Haney Architects had big dreams for the Orpheum Building, which they called the Renaissance Hotel Corporation South Park Mall Revitalization Project. They asked the city for $326,000, $1.6 million today, in a plan which would relocate the residents at the Dayton Care Center and create a conference center, transforming the Dayton to a high-class 75-room hotel with a skywalk connected to a 600-seat conference center in the Orpheum building. Pitts and Haney imagined the complex spurring a whole new outward appearance for the area and downtown Kenosha as a whole. In December 1981, the Community Development Block Grants Citizen Advisory Committee voted to not recommend what was known as the Dayton Orpheum Project. At the time, they cited a lack of private investor commitments and insufficient planning. Despite the funding denial, Tom Pitts was not discouraged. We definitely feel that the project is still on, he said at the time, according to the Kenosha News. No two ways about it. The city council is the final review agency. It took a while, but in November 1983, the city council took the first step by voting to spend $255,000 in federal money over the next three years to rehabilitate the classic Dayton Hotel. However, the dreams of the Dayton Orpheum Project were beginning to fade. 
In March of 1984, the last operating movie theater in downtown Kenosha, and the last of Kenosha's grand old movie houses, the Lake Theater, announces they will close their doors, citing lack of business. They will later reopen as the Rhodey Opera House. In the mid-1980s, the storefronts of the Orpheum interestingly featured an ironic mix of beliefs and practices. On the second floor was the Bible Baptist Church, and the Blue Moon Curio, an occult bookstore, was on the street level. Pastor Dana Kirshen of the 35-member Bible Baptist Church told the Kenosha News in 1984 that he is opposed to the occult, but stated, I don't perceive it as a threat. I view it as an opportunity to convert. Plans for the conference center fell through completely. And by the end of 1986, many downtown business owners, particularly those of the Kenosha Lakeshore Group, were calling for the building to be raised. In early 1988, a group of young people attempted to revive the Orpheum as Performing Arts Center. It was a quick trip for young Kenosha boy Kelly McKay. What began as a project on the Gateway Student Radio Station grew into a local television show and then expanded into hosting concerts. McKay, along with Jeff Moody, Jim Wells, and others, were producers of the Jones Intercable Public Access Music Show Video Brain Damage later known as Video Whiplash. McKay and his cohorts developed a relationship with indie record labels across the nation and would get new videos of the hottest young bands and the opportunity to see these upcoming bands live, like the Red Hot Chili Peppers and Fishbone, at nearby venues to record for their shows. It didn't take long for McKay to look into local venues to book these acts who were coming to the area. One of the first places he looked was a large warehouse on 22nd Avenue and 56th Street, now home to the VMC Lofts. That place didn't quite suit his needs, but the owner of the building, one Bernie Chulu, told him about a theater he owned in downtown Kenosha and how that might work. It was a mess, McKay told me in a recent interview. It was the middle of winter, and there was a waterfall of ice coming from the ceiling. Backstage behind the carton was three feet deep in pigeon feces and carcasses. I put the word out, and the next thing you know, I had a ton of people around my age who were totally into it. I was 17. I came from a performing arts background in school. My hope was to have a youth-directed performing arts center. It took three months to clean everything out of the theater. McKay said he would sleep in one of the empty offices so he can get up at the crack of dawn, stop at Frank's Diner for coffee, then work on the theater throughout the day. On April 7, 1988, in an attempt to raise funds for paint and other necessities, an art show was organized by McKay with the help of a Dale Dr. Destruction Wambolt. The event included a cookout outside the mall. This was during the Southport Mall era downtown when 6th Avenue was closed off as a pedestrian mall. For a small fee, people were able to take a sledgehammer to a Chrysler automobile. Kenosha's relationship with Chrysler in the 1980s is a story for another time. By May, the Orpheum was ready for its rebirth as a concert venue. McKay also cites Moody, Jack Koshik, Don Lipke, and Tony Jakubowski as his essential team at the time for obtaining these acts. The first act which was booked to play the grand opening on May 27, 1988 was Zodiac Mind Warp and The Love Reaction. This sleazy British hard rock band was heating up the charts and the MTV airwaves with their recent debut album and the singles Prime Mover and Backseat Education. They were the perfect band at the time to bring the Orpheum back as a prime concert venue. Their tour was even promoted on MTV, possibly the first time Kenosha was mentioned on the iconic music channel. The band arrived in Kenosha and were excited to take the stage for their Friday night performance. But the organizers were concerned. The night before, they were up all night preparing the Orpheum for the event, even having plumbing equipment flown in at the zero hour so the basement bathroom was in full operation. Superior light and sound were on hand to provide a spectacular show. But the one thing they were waiting for was the proper permit. As the band hung around in the Southport Mall tossing a football around, just hours before the show, the word came down from the city. The show was not going to happen. We were shut down because there was a piece of missing tile. And they didn't issue our permit, McKay recalls. After going to the downtown bid board meetings, it was pretty clear that they were against anything like this happening downtown. But they couldn't stop them. The tiles were fixed, the permits were granted, 
and concerts did come to the Orpheum in 1988. The Orpheum hosted a number of shows throughout that summer and fall, including national acts like Overkill, Nuclear Assault, Warzone, and Dag Nasty, as well as local favorites Ashcan School, Die Monster Die, Beautiful Burt, Numbskull, and Screamer. Lifelong Kenoshian Chris Basowitz was a young teenager at the time and excited to experience live music in Kenosha. I always loved the theaters and being able to go inside and think of how it once was was really cool. I was 14 at the time and started getting my own identity in life. The Orphan shows were my first experience of live music, and I was swept up in the spirit of it, he told me in a recent interview. Music, particularly live and local stuff, has a soul-saving spirit that has got me through tough times more than anything. Lisa Henthorn, rhythm guitarist of the band Oops at the time, recalls the night her band played with Die Monster Die on Halloween 1988. It was awesome. It was one of my first gigs. I was nervous what the place sounded and looked so freaking cool. It was definitely the perfect Halloween gig, Henthorn said in a recent interview. Before the show, we got to wander around the building a little bit. It was kind of spooky. Some parts it looked like it had just closed and things were still in their places. We explored through the tunnel under the road and found a barbershop with the combs still in the now empty glass jars that were once filled with cleaner solution. The Smashing Pumpkins played their first out-of-state show in Kenosha at the Orpheum on November 18, 1988. The little-known Chicago band was building a solid reputation and were owning their skills at Chicago clubs Avalon, 21 Club, and the Metro before coming to Kenosha. McKay recalls his interaction with the future superstar frontman at the time. I remember sitting on the corner with Billy Corgan from Smashing Pumpkins, and he asked me what I thought of his band's name. I told him I personally didn't like it, but it was clever and marketable, and they should stick with it. The band, later known for the hits Today and Bullet with Butterfly Wings, would be so inspired by the aesthetic of the Orpheum's interior that they would return a few weeks later to take promotional pictures inside the theater. Many of these photos were reported to have been published in independent magazines soon afterwards, but they are still a few years away from being on the cover of the Rolling Stone. The Orpheum as a concert venue was a valiant effort through 1988, but unfortunately, it did not last. Heating and other problems curtailed performances in the winter of 88 to 89, and after conflicts between the event organizers and property owner Bernie Chulu, live music would not return in 1989. In January 1990, we almost lost the Orpheum. Police were called to the theater and reported a group of teens inside who had started two fires to keep warm. The fires were extinguished as several of the young people tried to flee. The police managed to arrest a 19-year-old woman and two boys aged 17 and 14. At this time, the Orpheum was perhaps in the worst condition of its history. The businesses occupying the storefronts were gone. The offices upstairs were empty. In September of 1990, the classic marquee was removed by city order. By 1992, the Orpheum was seriously face-to-face -face with the wrecking ball. Many city officials saw it as an eyesore and were hoping for a redevelopment. James Schultz, director of the City Department of Housing and Neighborhood Development, said that the necessary repairs for the building were well over the value of the building. That building has been a sore spot for the downtown for many years now. The manner of raising it is being reviewed. I imagine it's something we're going to proceed on in the very near future, Schultz said at the time, according to the Kenosha News. Owner Bernie Chulu did not want to see his theater be destroyed. I think I'm being singled out, Chulu said in 1992, as reported by the Kenosha News. There are a lot of buildings downtown in worse shape than mine. There is no justification for preserving the building, said Ray Forgiani at the time while serving as city development director. Alderman Frank Passetti, council chairman and chairman of the City Redevelopment Authority, concurred. It's a travesty inside. It doesn't make economic sense. But one citizen stood strongly on the side of the decrepit theater, Lou Regani, at a time a member of the Landmarks Commission. Restoration upgrades an area and returns a sense of place to a neighborhood while creating jobs during the restoration work and employment afterwards, Regani said in 1993, according to the Kenosha News. Rugani recalls those days in a more recent interview. The demolition cost for the Orpheum would be about half a million bucks, and we suggested giving that money to any developer who would reopen it, which makes sense, he told me. Rugani, with the help of other preservationists like Merrick Phillips, helped save the Orpheum from the wrecking ball 
and was declared a local landmark by the end of 1993. But being a local landmark was more of a glamorized term than an official sign of salvation. In October 1994, Mayor John Antaramian delivered what could have been the death sentence to the Orpheum. There needs to be a resolution in the next 30 days, Antaramian said, as reported by the Kenosha News. After that, it's time to start the process of bringing the building down. Although many claim the building was beyond repair, it was repaired and reopened, and rather quickly, too. Jeffrey Mayer, chairman of JDM International Realty, bought the building in early 1995, and costs for renovation are said to have run close to $500,000. On November 19, 1995, the Orpheum triumphantly reopened as a two-screen budget theater. Moviegoers could pay $2, which is $3.66 today, to see Babe, A Walk in the Clouds, or Apollo 13 on its opening weekend. However, this new Orpheum looked a little plain from the street view, since construction issues delayed the installation of the new marquee by over a week. One person from the Orpheum's past returned when it reopened as a budget theater. Kelly McKay saw the theater was being renovated and investigated. I lived across the street, above Daisy's Vanity Shop. I walked over to see what was going on and talked to them. I got hired when they opened and was later promoted to assistant manager. It was a great part-time job. Within a few years, the theater would split once again, now occupying four screens, with the former balcony being converted to two additional theaters. But the variety in films over four smaller screens, even at budget prices, couldn't keep the audiences. It wasn't just the movies on the inside of the theater around this time. The street outside the Orpheum and the building was a backdrop for a small scene in the 1995 movie The Last Great Ride, starring Ernest Borgnine and Eileen Brennan. When Borgnine's character tells a story to the other characters, we're given a visual flashback to 1942 Chicago, which was actually 6th Avenue Kenosha around 1999. Automobiles from that era line the streets for the clip. The marquee at the Orpheum advertised the 1948 Humphrey Bogart film Treasure of the Sierra Madre. And yes, that year is an error on the filmmaker's part, not me. The scene, which is less than a minute long, cements the Orpheum building in cinematic history from a totally different perspective. By spring of 1999, Orpheum developer Jeff Mayer stopped making payments on the $265,000 loan, and by November, the Orpheum was facing foreclosure. The Orpheum once again closes doors in January 2000. But interest in the building was still going strong. One was Illinois developer Paul McDonough. When I first started buying buildings in downtown Kenosha, I purchased two on the same day. I called them Beauty and the Beast, McDonough told me in a recent interview. The Beauty was the Market Square building on the corner of 56th and 6th Avenue, now owned by Anytime Fitness owner Louis Areco. The Beast was the Orpheum. At the time, this historic four-story building had gone through a sheriff auction, but there were no takers. Johnson Bank owned the property via foreclosure. While it was vacant of tenants, it was occupied by hundreds of pigeons who flew in and out of the various broken windows. While we toured the building, one of the bankers quite literally got sick and threw up during the walkthrough. Nonetheless, McDonough purchased the Orphan Building in 2001 and put $200,000 into the building looking to attract new businesses. We filled 27 dumpsters removing all that trash and debris out of the building, he recalls. We installed 42 new thermopane windows with maroon frames that match the large theater marquee. We then built three new commercial storefronts along 6th Avenue. The storefronts each had their own heating and air conditioning, new restrooms, oak hardwood floors, new period art deco chandeliers, the whole works. Although his offer of six months free rent didn't get any bites on the four theater movie house, three businesses did move into the storefronts in the spring of 2003. Peace Tree Originals, the wireless phone company Nextel, and Divine Essentials. I give credit to my tenants, McDonough said in 2003 as reported by the Kenosha News. They are pioneers to go into that space. As time went by, McDonough, a consummate businessman, put the building back on the market. Jennifer and John Heim bought the building in 2005 and opened 
the laboratory toy store in the southwest corner. At the time, the Himes had dreams of reopening the cinema. Is the equipment current and does it work? Will we be able to use all those seats? Jennifer Himes speculated in 2007, according to the Kenosha News. But we're definitely happy with it and we would like to see the theater reopen at some point. But money was an issue and the theater needed upgrading, including becoming handicap accessible. Dale Wambolt, a.k.a. Dr. Destruction, helped keep the spirit of the Orpheum alive by hosting numerous events, including a concert with his band Dead Leathers in 2009, and appearances in the following years in front of the theater, including the Gypsy Museum of the Macabre and the Summer of Lovecraft Art Fair. Although visitors found the toy store a unique community asset, the cash registers didn't share that enthusiasm. In the spring of 2014, the Himes were looking for new owners to take over the toy store and the Scoops ice cream shop. Himes Toy Store closed their doors in the summer of 2014, and the Heim family relocated to Chicago and began renting the space. Julie and Carl Soldenwagner bought Scoops and relocated the store in early 2017 to 8th Avenue. In the 21st century, the theaters may remain dark, but the storefronts saw some activity. Some of the additional businesses that occupied the retail shops in the past 20 years also include Elsie Mays, and currently Bellissima's Boutique and Kenosha Beauty Supply. In September 2016, the Orpheum received another shot of life when Alex Kaderna, owner of Backyard Dream Productions, purchased the building with big dreams of turning portions of the four-story complex into a digital production studio, rented office space, movie theater, concert venue, restaurant, and more. It seems that cleaning up the building is a never-ending process and a recurring theme for each owner. As we began to clean up the building from years of vacancy and reservations, I found original ceilings that were hidden by drop ceilings, found plastic work and old windows framed up behind drywall, a lot of hidden crawl spaces and nooks. We even found a Playboy magazine from the 70s in a closet. Kaderna told me in a recent interview. By December 2017, Kaderna opened the O in the second floor of the building as a shared and short-term office space. It could be a stepping stone, Kaderna said at the time, according to the Kenosha News. A business might be here for two months. The next month, maybe they'll go by their own place. Or if someone has a home office and they want to go somewhere nicer for client meetings, I want to help the community as a stepping stone. The Orpheum had a lot of owners over the years, Kaderna told me. I feel they caused a lot of historical damage in the 1990s when they tried to save the theater by adding four theaters. For the short time that it was open, I don't feel it was worth it to destroy the architecture and history of the theater. The two owners after that did a lot to preserve the building and added much needed infrastructure. I have learned that it is not cheap to keep up a building of this scale or historic nature. It takes someone with the love of history to truly care about it. My goals are to keep moving forward and making sure the infrastructure is adequate to keep it around for another 100 years. And of course, have a working theater. As the Orpheum celebrates 100 years, Kaderna says that a birthday party for his beloved building is a must. For the 100th anniversary, we're planning a two-day block party, he said. I can't release too many details yet, but you won't want to miss this event. As the owner of Backyard Dream Productions, Kaderna is indeed a self-professed dreamer. The Orpheum is a long way from his glory days. But Kaderna said that if money wasn't an issue, the Grand Movie Palace will return. What I would love to do, if I could afford it, he said, would be to restore the theater to as close to its original condition as possible. Seen for 1400 a full balcony, modern parking garage in the back, bring national acts here to perform. We can appreciate that dream, Mr. Kaderna, and we're rooting for you to make the second hundred years of the Orpheum even better than the first. Let's turn it now. In January of 2022, I was invited to tour the Orpheum in its current situation. Here I am coming down from the balcony, looking out towards the street doors there. This is the lobby they renovated in 2016. New paint, new light fixtures. The nook to the right here was cut out of the actual theater space. 
to use for possible events. Here we enter into the theater. This was originally the two theaters of the Orpheum in the 90s. And of course, like the full theater in its heyday. So this is both theaters together here. The wall on the left was built as the new screens for the theater in the 90s. We're going to walk around back here to get a look at the original stage area. There is a large uh, stairway scaffolding here in the way. That is the new wall built in the 90s here on the left. And on the right here is the stage, the original Orpheum stage. Below here is the orchestra pit. The little doorway down there went to a dressing rooms with stairwells going up on either side of the stage.